In this lesson, we're going to be talking about graphing quadratic functions. And we've actually already done this before. So if you remember way back earlier in the course, we were graphing parabolas. And we did this by using our shifts. So we had shifts to the left and right. We had shifts up and down. And then once we figured out where that vertex, where kind of the bottom point of that parabola was, then we went ahead and used this 1, 4, 9 rule that said every time I take a step over, I go up by 1. If I take two steps over from the vertex, I'm going to go up by 4. And if I take three steps over from the vertex, I go up 9. And if there's a negative in front of the x squared, then instead of going up by 1, 4, and 9, we went down by 1, 4, and 9. So we dealt with this before, and so as long as we have our quadratic functions, our parabolas written in the form of these shifts, they're pretty easy to graph. And that's really what we want to look at as we move through this lesson, is that all I really need in order to graph a quadratic function is to know where the vertex is, which we can usually get from shifts, and then the whole 1, 4, 9 thing. That gets me the whole parabola. And that's basically the approach that we want to take here, is we're going to say, how can I figure out where the vertex is, and how can I figure out how to do the whole 1, 4, 9 thing? If I can do that, given any quadratic function ever, I can graph them all. So we're going to actually start with some review. First one that we want to look at here, we got y equals x squared plus 2. The review portion here is to remember that when this plus happens after the square, that that's going to be a shift, in this case, up since it was positive. So that's a shift up by 2, meaning my vertex starts off 2 units above. And remember that 1, 4, 9 rule, we're counting by 1, 4, and 9 from the original point, from the vertex. So when I take one step over, I'm going up by 1 from the vertex. When I take two steps over, I'm going to go up by 4 from the vertex. And when I take a third step over, I'm going to go up by 9 from the vertex. I play a little connect the dots, and that's my parabola. Now moving forward, you'll notice I skipped a little thing called the axis of symmetry. We're going to get back to that in a second. I want to remind you that when the plus or minus happens inside the parentheses before the squaring, that's a shift in the left or right direction. Now in the case of minus 2 like this one, that's a shift to the right. If that had been plus 2, that'd be a shift to the left. So we shift to the right by 2, and then we do the whole 1, 4, 9 thing. So we go up by 1, then we go up by 4, and again we're going up by 4 from the vertex, and then we go up by 9 from the vertex for the next step out. We connect our dots, and we're good. But I want to talk about this thing called the axis of symmetry that you've seen on both these pages. Now, when we look at this parabola, one of the things that we should have been doing up to this point anyhow is making sure that it actually looks symmetric. It looks the same on the left and the right. And one of the reasons that we want to make sure of this is really just to make sure you didn't make a mistake. One of the errors I see all the time is people accidentally counting two over instead of one over, and now they got a lopsided looking parabola. It should look symmetric. So how is it symmetric? Where is the mirror at? Well, the mirror is kind of right there in my yellow highlighter. If I go back to the first problem, the mirror is right here. So we're symmetric with respect to that highlighted yellow line. Now, if I want to give you the equation of that highlighted yellow line, it's a vertical line, and so it's going to be x equals something. That's how we do a vertical line. So in this case, it's x equals 0, because that's the x value that it's at. And in this case, the axis of symmetry is the line x equals 2. So it's basically just going to be x equals and then the x value of the vertex. Now when you're asked for the axis of symmetry, make sure that x equals is there. So keep in mind, this is not x equals in the sense of I'm solving an equation and this is the value of x. It's x equals in the sense of I'm writing the equation of a line in two dimensions, and by writing x equals, I'm saying the y value doesn't matter. I'm going to hit every y value possible, but the x value is always 2 in this case. In other words, it's a vertical line. So that's the important part here is that we need the x equals. We can't just say axis of symmetry is 2. 
that doesn't make sense. That's not an equation. We need to say x equals 2 because that's an equation. And in particular, it's a vertical line. Now, we're not going to deal with any other axes of symmetry besides vertical lines in this class, but we really could. I mean, you can imagine having a parabola that opens up on some sort of angle or a parabola that opens up on its side. So we can have axes of symmetry that are different than a vertical line. We're just not going to deal with them in this particular class. In this particular class, we're just dealing with parabolas that open up or down. All right, so the next thing we need to figure out then is uh, the new part to this particular lesson beyond what we did previously in terms of review is we are going to deal with having coefficients in front of our x squared. So like in this problem here we have 2x squared. We want to see what does that 2 do to our parabola. So I do want to point out that this is labeled an intro. This is not an actual example. So by it being an intro, I'm going to walk you through the idea behind what we're doing. What I'm about to do now isn't how I eventually want you to solve it. It's not the most efficient way to graph these things. It's an explanation of how we can get to that point of how we can do things efficiently. So with that said, what I'm going to do to kind of explore what's going on here is I'm just going to go back to our old-fashioned t-table, pick some values, plug them in, see what they get. So I'm going to pick values of 0, 1, 2, and 3 for my x's, and then also we'll do negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So let's start in the middle at 0. If we plug 0 into this function, we're going to get 2 times 0 squared. Now, we do the 0 squared first, and we get 0, and then we multiply that answer by 2. That's still 0. Now, what happens when we plug in 1? When we plug in 1, we get 2 times 1, which is 2. What about when we plug in 2? When I do 2 times 2 squared, that's 2 times 4 or 8. What happens when I plug in 3? 2 times 3 squared would be 2 times 9, which is 18. Now, when I do the negatives, I'm going to get the same thing. I'm going to get 2, 8, 18, because if you square a positive or square a negative, you get the same value. But what I want you to notice about my work over here is what happened in parentheses in that highlighted area over there. Those numbers are familiar. 1, 4, 9. Well, of course they're familiar. It's 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared. We've used this 1, 4, 9 rule for graphing these parabolas before. But then once I got 1, 4, 9, I had to multiply by that coefficient of 2. And so that's really what's going on here. And that's how I actually want you to be able to graph these guys is instead of needing to go through all these steps that I just went through, we're going to say, well, let's take our normal 1, 4, 9 rule and let's just multiply those values by my coefficient, by 2. And now my rule is a 2, 8, 18 rule. So then I'm going to start at the origin. There's no shifts going on in this particular problem. And as I take my first step over, instead of going up by 1, I'm going to go up by 2. My next step over, I'm going to go over, go up by 8. My next step over will be up by 18. I don't have enough room on my graph for that. But the idea there is it shows me how steep I am. We don't ever want to extend our graphs too much further beyond the last ordered pair that we plotted. We don't want to guess. We want to say, all right, this is the information that I have. This is all I'm going to give you. So this is going to be a bit more stretched out vertically. What you can sort of picture is you can picture someone grabbed the parabola up here with their hand and they held it steady down here and they pulled the parabola up. So if you pull the parabola up, it sort of stretched it out, giving it the illusion of being skinnier. That's what happened when we multiplied by this constant of 2. So let's go ahead and look at an example that we would solve in graphing and how I want you to approach it. So for this example, we're looking at negative 3x squared as what we're graphing. Oops. So notice that there's no shifting, so there's no pluses or minuses. We're just multiplying by negative 3. So what I expect you to do is I expect you to say, let me take my old 1, 4, 9 rule, 
And let me multiply each of those values by negative 3. I expect you to plot your vertex, where in this case, again, there was no shifting going on. And then to say, if I take a step over, my first step over is to go down by 3. My next step over is to go down by 12. Now the 27 I can't really hit. But there we go. And if we are asked for the axis of symmetry, it would be x equals 0. So in general, when we're graphing something that has a coefficient, or when we're graphing a quadratic function with a coefficient with an a value in there, it's going to look the exact same as if the a wasn't there. But instead of using a 1, 4, 9 rule, we're using a 1a, 4a, 9a rule. So we're just going to multiply the 1, 4, 9 by whatever that a is, by whatever that coefficient is. That's the main plan here. And once we know that, all we've got to do is remember all of our shifts and apply those too. And that's pretty much all we've got to worry about for this entire lesson. Until we start to get to things that aren't written in the nice form of the shifts. But that's not hard either. Alright, so now we're looking at a little bit trickier example, but let's try to dissect each piece that's going on. So as we look at this and what's going on, let's start off with the plus 2 that's happening on the outside. So that plus 2 that's happening on the outside, that's going to be a shift up by 2 units. If we look at the minus 4 that's happening on the inside, remember that a, sh a minus on the inside is a shift to the right now by 4 units. Now there's another 4 in the problem, but this 4 that's out front is different. That 4 is our coefficient. So that 4 tells me that instead of a 1, 4, 9 rule, I'm going to have a 4, 16, 36 rule. I take my normal 1, 4, 9, and I multiply by that coefficient 4. So now all that information I have jotted down is all I need to graph this thing. Because it's saying let's shift to the right by 4 and up by 2 units, and let's place our vertex there. And now if I take a step over, I need to go up by 4. If I take another step over, I'm going up by 16. Again, this is from the vertex. We're going up 16 from the vertex. Now, we don't have enough room on this graph to go up by 36, but this shows us that we have a super duper duper skinny parabola now. So by multiplying by positive 4, we're stretching this by a factor of 4, making it fairly skinny. But that's really it. Now again, if you were asked for the axis of symmetry, which you won't on every problem, but if you were, it would be x equals, and then the x value of the vertex, which is x equals 4. All right, so let's do one more before we shift gears. So again, we can break this one apart piece by piece. And we can start off on the outside with that minus 3 and say that minus 3 is telling me that this guy shifts down 3 units. We can look at the plus 1 that's on the inside of the squaring and say that's a shift to the left by 1 unit. And then the 1 half coefficient out in front is to say what should I do with my 1, 4, 9 rule? I should cut them all in half to do 1 half, 2, 9 halves. So if I go down 3, left 1, that gives me my vertex of where I'm starting off. Now the 1 half is something that you might not easily be able to click on as far as uh, our graphing, but we could still jot it down. Now as I go 2 units over and I go up by 2, that might be easier to click on as far as your graphing 
in our homework system. And so that's something to think about is to say, I know almost every time we're clicking on the very first point after the vertex, but that's not necessary. When we're clicking on these things in our homework management system, we could go ahead and go two spots over and two up in this case. Now our third, st yeah, third step over was at four and a half. So I can go up one, two, three, four and a half. Now I could really keep going if I wanted to. One, four and nine are your perfect squares. So the next perfect square would be 16, half of which is eight. So I really could go up to that value as well, which isn't a bad idea because the more ordered pairs we have, the more accuracy we have to our graph. And that's just a good thing. And if you miss some of your dots, that's okay. By putting the dots there, you're kind of saying, hey, I'm aiming for this one. That's what I'm trying to hit. If I sort of miss because I'm not very good at drawing, that's okay. But there we go. So that's how we handle a fraction. So now I want to shift gears a little bit. So hopefully those last three examples you were able to handle fairly well and say, yeah, that, that's not too bad. I don't mind graphing these quadratic functions. This is pretty easy. Most of it's just review from what we did way back earlier in the course with our shifts. And now the only thing new that we've learned so far is instead of 1, 4, 9, sometimes we've got to multiply that by our constant, by our coefficient out in front, and just graph a little bit stretched out or a little bit fattened version of a parabola. So, so far, not too bad. But so far, all of our parabolas, all of our quadratic functions have been written in this form of a times x minus h squared plus k. So that begs the question, what if they're not written in that form? What if they're written in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c? So not in this nice factored looking version where the shifts are obvious. How do I graph this? Well. At this point, this isn't going to be our best answer that I'm going to give you. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to take this form that we don't like and turn it into that form that we do like. That's going to be our kind of goal. But I'm going to take a step back for a minute. I'm going to kind of give you the punchline here. We did the same thing when we were solving quadratic equations. We said, if they're written with perfect square on one side, number on the other, they're easy. What if they're not written in that form? Well, let's get them in that form by completing the square. OK, that's all well and good, but completing the square can be a pain in the butt sometimes. So how can I make that easier? Well, we did completing the square on ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And we came up with this formula that did it for us, the quadratic formula. It was x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's basically what we're going to do here. We're going to start off saying, if this quadratic function is not in the form I like, let's do completing the square to get it in that form. And that way, graphing is easy. But then we're going to say, well, instead of completing the square each time, why don't we try to do this as a formula? And that's what's going to happen. We're going to come up with a formula to find the vertex. To say, all right, if I just know where the vertex is, and I know what the a value is, I know how to graph this thing. So before we get to that point, let's go ahead and do completing the square a couple times so we can see where the pitfalls are, but then also so we can apply it to the general situation. So this first one's actually not too hard to do completing the square with. Now normally completing the square, our first step is to take the constant, in this case the negative 12, and to shove it to the other side. But we actually don't want to do that in this case because we like the fact that there's f of x on the left-hand side. We don't want to add anything else. We want to have y equals. So all I'm going to do is something very simple and just say, I'm going to leave a blank here. I'm going to leave a blank and just leave the minus 12 on the outside of my parentheses. Because really what I'm trying to complete the square on is I'm trying to make a square here. I'm OK if there's something that happens afterward. So my square is going to be the stuff that's in parentheses that I'm trying to complete. So remember, in order to complete the square, we take the middle coefficient, divide by 2, and then square it to get the magic number. So if I take negative 4 and divide by 2, that's negative 2. Squared is 4. 
Now, typically what we did before is we said, hey, if I'm going to add this magic number of 4 to one side, I better add it to the other side of the equation as well. But as we just said, I don't want to add anything to the left. So what I want to do is I'm just going to keep this equation balanced by saying, if I add 4 to this right-hand side, I could also subtract 4 from the right-hand side. And that way, if you look at what I've done in blue, there's a net change of 0. So I add 4 and subtract 4 at the same time, nothing changed. But what I can do now is the stuff in parentheses is in fact a perfect square. And so now this is written in the nice form. I could say my vertex is 2, negative 16, because it's shifted to the right 2, and then down 16. And the coefficient out in front is really 1. There's nothing written there, so we assume it's a 1 meaning I would use a 1, 4, 9 rule if I wanted to graph this thing. So once I completed the square, I would be able to graph it if I wanted to, or I could write it in the vertex form nicely. But here's where things get hairy. Once we actually have a lead coefficient out there, it gets a little hairy. Let me walk you through this, and if you get lost, not the end of the world, because we're going to try to make it better here in a second anyhow. So when you do have a lead coefficient, we need to factor that lead coefficient out. Because just with, completing, uh, with completing the square, remember, we want to make sure that the coefficient of the x squared is just 1. So I only needed to factor it out of the stuff that's in parentheses. The plus 2 on the outside can stay plus 2. Now I need to add my magic number. So I take my middle coefficient, which is negative 2, divide by 2 to get negative 1, squared to get 1. Here's where things get tricky. You might be tempted to subtract 1 in order to balance it out. That would be wrong. Because we didn't just add 1 to this side of the equation, because that 3 is going to distribute through. So we actually added 3 to balance that out. We need to subtract 3. And that's where things get a little confusing, and they get even more confusing when I start throwing negatives as coefficients. So this would end up being 3 times x minus 1 squared minus 1, once we combine like terms on the right. So we'd be able to see that our vertex is 1, negative 1, and instead of a 1, 4, 9 rule, we'd have a 3, 12, 27 rule because of the fact that the a value is 3. So this is what we technically could do with completing the square. I'm not a big fan of that, though. So quite frankly, let's not complete the square. Let's try to come up with a formula that does completing the square for us. So that's what I want to do next, is I want to go back to the same strategy that I used with quadratic equations. And I want to say, let me take this generic quadratic function and let me complete the square on it. So, the first thing I do is factor the a out. So when I factor the a out of the middle term, I get b over a. The plus c on the outside, he can stay there, that's fine. Now for my magic number here, I'm going to take the middle coefficient, which is b over a. I'm going to divide by 2 and then I'm going to square it. Now to balance that out, some funky stuff has to happen. So I got to actually do the squaring, then I got to distribute the a, then I got to do the opposite. But I'm going to cut to the chase here. I don't care what happens on the outside, and I'll explain why in a minute. So I'm just going to say I'm going to balance it out with some stuff. I don't care what that stuff is. Now we can go ahead and factor the what's in parentheses there because it's guaranteed to be a perfect square, and the thing I'm squaring is b over 2a. So I have some stuff with a star, because it's actually got a plus c in there. Whatever. That's the, here's the important part. The important part is that the form I wanted was a times x minus h squared plus k. So the a's, they match up. The letter a was not used by accident. The coefficient of your x squared 
is the a value that you multiply by 149. But here's the important part. Most important part of this entire lesson is right there. That h is the opposite of b over 2a. The x value of the vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. Let me repeat that. The x value of the vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. Memorize that. The x value of the vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. The most important thing you can get from this entire lesson. Now, the one thing that we have left off is the k, the y value of the vertex. That's the part that I just called stuff. Stuff with a star. The reason I don't care about figuring that out and coming up with a formula for it is we don't need a formula for it. If we can figure out the x value of the vertex, just plug that x value back into your original equation and get the y value. That's all. So we don't need a formula for it. We just plug it in. We have the equation in front of us. So now let's look at an example where we have this function written in the ax squared plus bx plus c format, and we're asked to do two different things, to find the vertex, but also to write the equation in the vertex form. So if I want to find the vertex, the x value of the vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. In this problem, our b is negative 4, so the opposite of that is positive 4. Our a value is 1, so 2 times 1 is 2. The x value of my vertex is just 2. The y value is to plug 2 back into the function. That's going to give me 2 squared minus 4 times 2 minus 12. So that's 4 minus 8 minus 12 is negative 16. So our vertex has an x value of 2 and a y value of negative 16. Now if my goal of this was to write this in the vertex form, now that I know the vertex, I can easily do that. It's x minus 2 squared minus 16. Simple as that. So we can write it in the vertex form if we know the vertex. We can find the vertex by using the vertex formula. The vertex formula is that the x value of the vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. And then we could graph from here if we wanted to as well. So we have lots of options on what we want to do. This vertex form formula is just a tool in your toolbox. Now example five here, I want to make sure I put in the notes for a good lesson that I like to tell people about math, but also really about life. So here's what old man me telling you something, giving you some wisdom. The wisdom I want to give is just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this is our life lesson for the day. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I say that about this problem because one of the things I see on problems like this is I see people that say, ooh, I can factor this. It's x plus 9, x plus 1. I'm awesome. Well, yes, you can factor it, but how is that helping you? This is a quadratic function. The information that you need to graph this function is you need the vertex and the a value. Factoring this doesn't help you get the vertex or the a value. So while you can do that, if you really want to, it's not helping you, so why do you want to do that? What we want is the vertex. So to find the vertex, we take the opposite of b over 2a. That's negative 10 over 2, or negative 5. To find the y value of the vertex, plug that value of negative 5 back in. We're going to get negative 5 squared plus 10 times negative 5 plus 9. That's 25 minus 50 plus 9. That's negative 25 plus 9. That's negative 16. When I wrote my example problems, I was just happy for negative 16 for some reason.
So we've got an x value of negative 5, a y value of negative 16. And notice that our a value is 1. We have no coefficient in front of the x squared, so it's a coefficient of 1, meaning we're going to use the good old-fashioned 1, 4, 9 rule. So let's come over to negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then down to negative 16. And there's our vertex. And from there, we're going to go up 1, up 4, up 9. Play connect the dots. And as I've said before, we're not going to extend our parabola beyond the dots that we have. There's no good reason to do that. You're only going to leave yourself open to error. There's our parabola. There's our answer. That's all we need. Vertex A value. That's it. To find the vertex, you got the opposite of B over 2A for the X value. For the Y value, you plug it back in. Alright, let's take one step up in difficulty before we change gears to start talking about some word problems. Let's throw an A value in there that's not 1. Now, this isn't going to change things up too much. We're still going to say my goal is to find the x value of the vertex. To do that, I'm going to take the opposite of b over 2a, which for this problem becomes positive 8 over 2 times 2 is 4. So the x value of the vertex is 2. The y value is going to be to plug 2 back in. So that's 2 times 2 squared minus 8 times 2, plus 11. So that's going to be 8 minus 16. There's our minus 16, <laughs> plus 11. 8 minus 16 is negative 8, and negative 8 plus 11 is 3. This gives me a vertex of 2 comma 3, with an a value of 2 because that's the coefficient of my x squared with an a value of 2. Instead of our normal 1, 4, 9 rule, we're going to use a 2, 8, 18 rule. And so again, the two pieces of information that I need to graph this thing are really the vertex and what happens due to the a value. So we start at 2, 3. We go up by 2 then up by 8, then up by 18 would take me up to 21, so that's just a little bit off the graph. And there we go. So throwing an A value into the mix isn't bad. Um, as we saw previously in this lesson, if that A value happened to be negative, then the parabola would be pointed down, so it would be going down instead of going up. But really that's what's going on there is find your vertex, find your a value, and you find your vertex by taking the opposite of b over 2a to find the x value. Take that x value, plug it back into the original problem, that gives you your y value. Simple as that. Now to wrap this lesson up, we're going to look at some applications of what it is that we were just dealing with. Those applications are going to be optimization problems. And by optimization, I'm saying that I want to find the best case scenario for a given situation. So I'm going to be looking for something that maximizes profit or minimizes cost. Something where I'm looking for the best situation out of an infinite number of situations. Now, the way that this is going to happen is we're going to be looking at problems that can be modeled with a quadratic function. And what we want to look at is to say if that quadratic function could be modeled by a parabola that opens up, then the minimum value that we ever see happens right there at the bottom. That's the vertex. And similarly, if our quadratic function is a parabola that opens down, then the vertex, that's going to be the max. The biggest it ever gets, the highest it ever gets is at the vertex. So what's going to happen in these problems then is if you see any word like 
the biggest, the best, the most, the largest, the least, the smallest, the minimum. Any optimization words like that, immediately your brain should click in to say, I need to find the vertex. But then there's another part to the question. So you got to read the word problem that's being asked of you, and when you're being asked about this vertex, you got to say, am I being asked about the x value or the y value? And a lot of times what's going to happen here is you're going to look at the units that are involved or how these variables are defined, and then also look at what you're actually being asked and figure out, am I being asked for the x value of the vertex or am I being asked for the y value of the vertex? So there's kind of two parts here, and in this particular lesson, it's super easy. The only word problems that we're solving are going to be these ones that ask you for the vertex. But I want you to point, or I want to point out that come time that we take a test over this entire chapter, or we take our final exam, or you're trying to do this in a real life situation, you got to understand that if the problem is asking you to optimize, that's what should clue you in to start thinking about the vertex. So let's take a look at this example. The cost C in dollars of manufacturing X bicycles at Brad's production plant is given by the function blah. Find the number of bicycles that must be manufactured to minimize the cost and find the minimum cost. The fact that we're seeing this word minimize and minimum those are the clues that tell us you're looking for the vertex. So let's put that into our notes just so that we can remember that. So the fact that we're seeing words like minimum, minimize, that's what's saying, let's look at the vertex. But then, when we're asked to find the number of bicycles, we have to decide, is the number of bicycles going to be the x value of the vertex, or the y value. And so we go back to read the problem and say the x value is the number of bicycles. Whereas when we're asked to find the minimum cost, the cost we can see is the y value of the vertex. Once we identify what this problem is even asking in the first place, the actual calculation is ridiculously simple. For part A, we're going to take the opposite of B over 2A. We're going to take 800 over 4. It's 200 bicycles. Simple as that. To find the minimum cost, we're just going to plug the 200 back in to do 2 times 200 squared minus 800 times 200 plus 92,000. So that, of course, is going to be some calculator work. But as far as how to do it, it's relatively straightforward and simple. We're just going to do 2 times 200 squared minus 800 times 200 plus 92,000, hit enter, and 12,000. Pretty simple. And these word problems should be pretty simple as long as we identify what's being asked. And again, that's the big clue, uh, the big, uh, the big kahuna here, the big goal is to say, first identify the fact that if it says minimum, maximum, the most, the least, the greatest, the best, the worst, whatever, make sure you know you're looking for the vertex. And then reread the problem and say, do I want the x value or do I want the y value? And find the appropriate one. For this last example, I want to remind you, when it comes time for our test, if I decide to put a question like this on the test, that you are required to show all of your steps in order to get to a correct answer. And I point that out because this particular version of this question is a relatively easy problem to do in order to kind of get a common sense answer. 
we're asked to find two numbers whose sum is 11 and whose product is as large as possible. Now, I'm not asking you to solve the problem this way, but geometrically what that means is it means let's create a rectangle where from this side to this side, if I add those two sides together, I get 11. This problem is saying make the area as big as possible. And I'm hoping it's clear that to make the area as big as possible, a square is your best bet, which means 5 and a half and 5 and a half on each side. And that is actually going to be our correct answer. But I would expect to see you actually translate this into a function and find the minimum besides just sort of taking a guess at your best bet. So in order to do that, we're talking about two numbers here. So we want to define these two numbers in symbols. So we have one number. We have the second number. If the first number is x and their sum is 11, the second number is 11 minus x. This is the same trick we've used a bunch of times on things like mixture problems and lots of situations, situations where we could add up the distance someone traveled and we knew it was 200 miles but didn't know the di either distance. We said one's x, one's 200 minus x. Same thing here. One of the numbers is x, the other is 11 minus x, because we know their sum is 11. Now, if we want to talk about their product, then, their product is when we take one number times the second number. Product means multiplication. So in terms of x, that product is x times 11 minus x. Or in other words, 11x minus x squared. In yet other words, negative x squared plus 11x. If I want to find the x value that made the product as large as possible, I could take the opposite of b over 2a. That's negative 11 over negative 2. That's 5.5. If I plug 5.5 into this, I get 5.5. So my two numbers are 5.5 and 5.5. Now I wanted to walk through this example to point out that this is a situation in which we are making the product as large as possible. We're only being asked about the numbers. We were never asked what the product was. So we never needed the y value of the vertex. But I could make this problem a little bit trickier as far as from the geometric standpoint that maybe instead of the geometric problem of a square, maybe I have a three-sided diagram. Because maybe I have a situation where there's a river flowing over here. And I want to fence in an area next to the river. So I only need three sides of fence. And let's say I have 500 feet of fence. Well, at that point, my side lengths could be x, x, and 500 minus the two x's that I already have. So that now the area would actually be x times 500 minus 2x. If I wanted to maximize the area of this situation, it's not as simple as saying it's going to be a square. Because really, we want to make use of as much of the river as possible because it's free. <laughs> So anyhow, I want to point that out because I gave you a simple problem up here, walk you through the process of how to solve it, but you could be asked more complicated questions like this one as well.